Tuesday, July 29, 2020. Welcome to BNAP Today. Hello, I'm Mike Ryan. Today, we look at Kodak. It's back and developing a new business plan. We've heard of all you can eat. Now there's an all you can fly deal. And for those after a billion dollar view for a million dollar seat, there's Virgin Galactic. Plus later, we visit South Korea and Indonesia on how they're tackling COVID-19 and at the same time, keep the heart of the economy beating. But first, the headlines. <laughs> Photographic film pioneer Eastman Kodak has reportedly signed a deal with the US government to help produce pharmaceutical ingredients in the country. The U.S. has turned to an American corporate icon for help in its bid to boost domestic sources for drug ingredients in the fight against the coronavirus. Eastman Kodak reportedly has signed a deal with the U.S. government to produce pharmaceutical ingredients in the U.S. The news sent Kodak shares up fourfold in early trading. The Wall Street Journal reports Kodak was awarded a $765 million loan under the Defense Production Act to speed up domestic production of drugs and lessen America's reliance on foreign sources like China and India. That's the same act President Donald Trump invoked to aid companies building ventilators. The journal says the ingredients Kodak will make will be used in generic drugs that include hydroxychloroquine, the anti-malarial drug Trump has touted to treat the coronavirus. Kodak filed for bankruptcy protection in 2012 after failing to embrace modern technologies such as the digital camera. The company told The Daily the loan will create up to 350 jobs in New York and Minnesota. Kodak did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Chinese airlines are offering all-you-can-fly deals in a bid to tempt travelers back into the air. Julian Satterthwaite reports. It can be daunting getting on a plane these days. But airlines in China have a new strategy for getting people flying again. China Southern Airlines on Tuesday became the latest to roll out an all-you-can-fly deal. That makes at least eight carriers in the country offering the passes. They generally cost around $500 and allow unlimited travel for specified periods. Industry watchers say the deals have helped revive a ravaged industry, filling lots of otherwise empty seats. Rival China Eastern Airlines has sold over 100,000 weekends-only passes, according to state media. Hainan Airlines offers unlimited travel to and from its home province. And the global air travel industry is watching to see if all this works. China is viewed as a test case for recovery, as it reopened its economy months earlier than many other places. Airlines there are now operating about 80% of the flights they provided in previous times. And they're not the only ones banking on deals. Marriott Group is also eyeing unlimited passes, following the success of one sold in April. It offered a month of buffet breakfasts at its hotels in China for 588 yuan, about $83. Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic Space Tourism Company unveiled the interior design for its space plane, which the company says will ferry tourists and scientists to space in the not-too-distant future. Conway G. Gittens has a look inside. With no less than 17 windows to give future space travelers a view from every possible angle, plus high-tech custom-fit chairs that strap in tightly for G4 speeds, and a mirror in the back of the cabin to show passengers what they look like floating once they leave the Earth, Richard Branson's space travel company, Virgin Galactic, is preparing to make space tourism as luxurious as possible. The billionaire entrepreneur's company revealed for the first time Tuesday what the inside of the space plane will look like when passengers finally get to take their suborbital flight to the edge of space. The space plane, as it is being called, is outfitted with just six passenger seats that will recline, allowing more air space when passengers go weightless. And that's just the beginning, says Virgin Galactic's chief space officer, George Whitesides. And so we're going to have this incredible thing where people have curated lighting during the, the launch period. And then that, then that lighting will change as it goes up into space. And then when they finally get into space and uh, can look down at planet Earth, the lighting will just fade to nothing so that people can just focus on 
um, you know, the beautiful sight of our home planet. Virgin Galactic has already sold out of its first batch of tickets, which cost $250,000 a ride for a 60-mile journey above Earth. The space plane has been outfitted with so much technology that passengers won't miss a thing during the 90-minute trip. So we, we actually have 16 cameras in the, uh, in the cabin, and at any moment, at least two of those cameras will be focused on each um, passenger or, or, or crew member. And so, um, so people are going to be just really documenting their experience as well in high definition stills and video so that when they get down, they're going to be able to share that incredible experience with you know, people on social. And they'll also get a special uh, curated film of their entire space experience that we'll be building from all of these different camera angles. By teasing the interior of the space plane, Virgin Galactic is trying to show it's making progress, even though it has yet to announce when customer flights will begin. It is currently in the late stages of flight tests. Branson is expected to lift off sometime this year, but he's not the only billionaire in the race to space. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos has Blue Origin and Tesla CEO Elon Musk has SpaceX, both companies have space tourism plans as well. Coming up next, Indonesia and its struggle to move forward. We are here. 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 Indonesia's business community has been encouraged to open, but what will be the cost? Indonesia Investments Managing Director Richard Vandershaw is an Indonesia expert with a decade plus focus on and experience in the Indonesian economy and business. Richard, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Tell us about Indonesia Investments and the services you offer your clients and the, the areas of expertise. Well, Indonesia Investments is a is a business consultancy, and we mainly aim at informing foreign investors, uh, which are non-Indonesian investors, to uh, about all investment possibilities in Indonesia. And we give objective and we try uh, information, and we try to give as accurate information as possible, so um, so they really know the real situation. And what we mainly do is we write and, and publish uh, reports which give gives updates on the Indonesian economy, politics and also social issues as long as these topics uh, may influence the investment environment. Uh, we also uh, write research reports, sometimes on demand, so when there's an institution which uh, wants to receive a report on, for example, the automotive industry or whatever, we can, we can uh, we can uh, give it, or just general research reports. And we also, through our network in Indonesia, we can assist foreign investors to, uh, to develop a company. We can find business partners, we can, uh, we can arrange permits, um, investment permits, etc. So that's, yeah, that, those are the main activities of Indonesia Investments. What have your most recent papers looked at Indonesia 
at the new normal and changes in society and in business sectors. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, obviously uh, all our, our recent reports are, are about the COVID-19 crisis, uh, which is a, it's, it's huge, of course, and it, it has derailed basically everything in the economy. So um, those, those business and, and social restrictions, they have far-reaching uh, effects on, on the Indonesian economy and uh, business cannot continue as usual. Um, so, for example, well, one of the consequences of the COVID-19 crisis is that e-commerce has now, it was already thriving before the crisis in Indonesia, but now since the crisis, it has really jumped um, uh, e-commerce activities. Uh, that's, that is also why the Indonesian government is now encouraging uh, the smaller entrepreneurs to also join the, the digital economy. But it is actually quite complicated because there are a lot of people in Indonesia um, who really have no digital skills and also well, lack the money to really uh, go online. But yeah, one of the yeah, consequences of the COVID-19 crisis is, is the development, rapid development of the e-commerce industry in Indonesia. So that's, that's part of the new normal, basically. What will be the enduring impacts of the virus on the Indonesian economy and society and some of the main challenges the Indonesian economy faces now? Well, actually, the, the thriving e-commerce industry, that's one. That, that will have a lasting impact. But uh, I think also Indonesians' awareness of health and hygiene, I think, uh, which, is, which has always been quite low. Um, and I think because of this COVID-19 crisis, people start to become more aware of, of health and, and hygiene. And actually what I will look into in a couple of weeks is whether this crisis has resulted in more uh, Indonesians um, getting like health insurance or whether there has been a jump in the um, in, 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 in members of the universal health care scheme which, which is run by the government it's a huge um, health care scheme so um, I think I think that's also a lasting impact that it has managed to uh, raise people's awareness, Indonesia's awareness of, of health and hygiene. How is the Indonesian government changing its response to COVID-19? Is, is, it, is it really now ramping things up and it's actually doing a good job? Well, I mean, there's actually a, an interesting change. So at first, uh, it's, it's also what I wrote in, in, in the report, is that the government, and it, this happened everywhere in the world, uh, that they prioritized the health of people over the economy. So um, that's why you had this, this huge uh, business and social restrictions. Well, the interesting thing is that I'm from the Netherlands, and when I read the news in the Netherlands, um, in the Netherlands, when the, the COVID-19 patients and casualties were almost zero, only then the government decided to loosen the restrictions. Well, in, in Indonesia, we don't see that. So in Indonesia, the number of new COVID-19 uh, cases and, and casualties is actually rising exponentially. But the government has already started to loosen the restrictions. So it's a, a quite risky, but um, it, basically it has no other, other, other option too, because if you keep, um, if you maintain those tough restrictions, then you, you kill the economy. So already we've seen millions of people in Indonesia becoming unemployed. Um, they are at risk of falling into full-blown poverty. So that's also a very, very big problem. And on the long term, it can kill even more people than, mm. than the, the people who die of, of corona. So uh, that's a big change. So that's the changing response. And then you asked also about whether it's doing a, uh, doing a good job. Well, that's um, the Indonesian government has allocated quite well plenty of funds for to, to combat the crisis, although in terms of uh, percentage of GDP, it's quite low compared to other countries. But the big problem is executing uh, the spending. 
that's always a big problem in Indonesia. And just yesterday or two days ago, you know, the Indonesian president, Jokowi, he also complained about the slow execution of those funds. So um, and one of the problems is that the bureaucracy in Indonesia is really tough. That's, um, that's also one of the big obstacles in the investment environment. So to get the money, to spend the money by, by local governments or government uh, ministries or other agencies, it's really tough. And partly because uh, a lot of a lot of the um, uh, government officials are a bit concerned to spend the money because they don't want to to to, to become involved in corrupt in corruption scandals. Mm. That, that's always uh, it's always a risk here in Indonesia. What are the business conditions like in Jakarta at the moment? At the moment, well, it, at the moment it's a little bit improving because the the Jakarta administration they east the restrictions so uh, you see more activity on the streets for example traffic as well uh, like one or two months ago the streets were almost empty and now it's again it's uh, severe uh, traffic congestion but not as much as before the crisis obviously but you can see that um, there's a, a small revival of economic activity uh, shopping malls are open again but they work uh, at, at uh, they run at 70 percent of capacity. Mm. Uh, there are all sorts of um, health, health and hygiene protocols, so it's not running on full capacity the local economy, but it is better now than one or two months ago. Has COVID-19 really whacked the small and uh, medium business sector? Yeah, that's yeah. Um, They've been heavily affected, um, and that's a big problem for the whole Indonesian economy because the, the small and micro entrepreneurs they account for and, and medium entrepreneurs they account for for like sixty percent of GDP, and also for for around ninety seven percent of the um, the labor force. They work in in the in the micro, small, and medium enterprises. So it's. It, they play a huge role in the Indonesian economy, but they are heavily affected. And usually, these smaller companies, they don't have uh, enough liquidity. So once the income or the sales um, uh, stop or diminish, then they get in serious trouble. And that's also why in the, in the, the, the government has allocated quite a lot of funds for these small and medium-sized companies. But again, execution is not, is not going very well. I can understand the uh, government wanting to open up the economy, especially with the small and uh, medium size of the micro uh, business sector. Uh, problem is though, the, uh, you can expect a, a rise in COVID cases. What's the, uh, your healthcare system like as in hospitals? Could they cope with a, a mass influx of COVID-19 patients? Well, it's at this moment. It seems like it can cope with uh, with the uh, patients. Um, I've I've been in a hospital, but that, two months ago, and I well, actually, I've been uh, in, into two hospitals over the past couple of months uh, during the crisis, and it was quite. Uh, it was not really that busy. Also on the um, emergency uh, in the emergency uh, first aid uh, room. There were not a lot of patients actually, which surprised me. But reading the Indonesian media, no, I, I don't see any stories about um, hospitals being too crowded or that they cannot handle patients. So, so at this moment, um, of course, Indonesia's healthcare system is quite fragile. But at this moment, it, it's as far as I know, it can cope with the situation. On a more general note, uh, Richard the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement is the first bilateral trade deal Jakarta has signed with the G20 economy since 2008. Is it signing other bilateral deals and does this signal a new era of openness to trade in Indonesia? Um, gradually, yes, they're opening up, but it's always a big dilemma for the policymakers. Uh, Indonesia is very hesitant 
to engage in free trade deals, uh, particularly because they are concerned that they will, they will, uh, they cannot compete with the influx of foreign foreign products. Um, Indonesia has a huge population, which is getting richer, so the, it has an expanding middle class uh, who have improving spending power. So they would like to import uh, consumer goods at attractive rates, but. Indonesian businesses are generally not as competitive compared to their foreign counterparts. So that's why Indonesia, Indonesians are always a little bit uh, afraid of engaging in free trade deals. But um, over the last couple of years, um, there are a couple of free trade deals signed and they want to sign more, including with the European Union. So it seems that they gradually they're opening up. but. It goes at a s slow pace. Would be very interesting doing business in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. COVID still lurking around the corner, which is uh, scary to say the least. Makes your job very interesting. Richard van der Schaar, uh, from Indonesia Investments. Thank you very much. After this break, the way ahead for South Korea and COVID-19. <music> are lions. We bring hope where it's needed. We are a global force for good. Join the movement. Support causes that matter. Change lives. Change communities. Change the world. We can do more together than we can alone. Join in. Experience the joy of serving. Be part of the movement. Give back. Let's unite the world for good. We are lions. You can be too. Visit weserve.org. A country that seems to be winning the COVID-19 battle is South Korea. The winning formula, however, may not be all that palatable to many Western democracies. Justin Fendos is a professor and the director of undergraduate studies at the Global Biotechnology Department at Dongseo University in Busan, South Korea. Justin, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Your recent article, How Surveillance Technology Powered South Korea's COVID-19 Response, covers an interesting aspect of South Korea's approach in managing the virus. Tell us about South Korea's success in suppressing the virus. So I think it's important to say, I mean, the numbers don't lie. And when you're looking at the global landscape of how different countries have responded differently to the virus, I think at this point it's pretty clear that you know, South Korea is one of the countries that's done very well. And if we're, for instance, comparing to Australia, uh, South Korea was one of the first countries outside of China to be exposed to the virus. They also have twice the population that Australia does and a staggering 160 times higher population density. So when you're just looking at those three characteristics, you would expect South Korea to have a lot more cases than Australia, but unfortunately, that's not actually what you see. In fact, over the last few days, Australia has now surpassed South Korea in total confirmed cases. So that you know should point to the idea that maybe South Korea is doing something pretty well. And those things that they're doing well are they have a very organized and uh, very well thought out strategy for how to do testing, contact tracing and quarantine. And more importantly, they have these three things kind of linked together so that the testing results immediately inform the contact tracing and that those tracing results can immediately uh, inform additional testing as well as additional quarantine. It's interesting you mentioned Australia, uh, same with the US and the other Western uh, such as uh, England and parts of Europe. Uh, all having a terrible time with uh, COVID-19. Yet you look at South Korea, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, uh, they seem to be a lot more uh, organized. Um, probably um, they're more concerned about 
less about, I would imagine, their, uh, their civil liberties because we, have, we can't use an app, we can use one, they'll know where we're going, we can't do that. Um, is this part of the, the reason why South Korea, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, uh, all those countries seem to be doing better than the US, Australia, New Zealand and, and so on? I do think that there are some strong cultural effects that are at play. So, for instance, in South Korea and most East Asian countries, actually, uh, the, the social structure is built in such a way so that, you know, most people don't want to harm other people. And there's a certain aspect of shame and guilt that's associated with that. So there's definitely a pretty strong cultural component. But in addition to this, there are also some infrastructural and uh, some political aspects that also need to be considered. So for instance, the countries that you named, especially Taiwan and South Korea, they had had some prior experiences with smaller epidemics, most notably MERS, which really gave them the opportunity to kind of work through some of the weaknesses of their protocols, which is a luxury that a lot of Western countries really just haven't had. And so that's also a really important aspect I think, of developing a very powerful and well thought out uh, infectious disease protocol. Interesting. The, uh, the other attitude would be, it's not going to happen to us. You know, where the, the yeah. US or England or Australia, New Zealand, it will happen to everybody else in Asia. And uh, you were much more prepared. Uh, but you would think, though, that we had that data at our fingertips that we could have implemented something much faster than we have. Right. So even it's important to note that before COVID-19, most countries technically on paper, they do have procedures that are written down in a book somewhere. But it's it's a big leap from having a procedure written down to actually a, being able to uh, use that procedure and put it into action. And so uh, especially in the, the MERS epidemic that uh, Korea experienced, that was one of the moments where they actually got to try out their procedures. And uh, they did learn some important lessons from that experience. So uh, the first thing that they learned was that they actually didn't have uh, adequate infrastructure to bring testing up to par, to have a large amount of tests created very quickly. And so following the MERS episode, one of the things that the government here did was they very quickly established that infrastructure and improved their connections with a lot of biotechnology companies so they could draw on those connections later if a larger epidemic happened, which is exactly what happened in COVID-19. But the second thing that happened too, which was kind of unexpected, was that the public really expressed a strong desire to be informed about what was happening. And so the first MERS case, uh, patient who came into Korea came in from overseas and was hospitalized at a, a facility in Seoul. And for quite a while, the central government didn't release any information, even anonymized information about what was going on. And what ended up happening was one of the doctors who was attending to this patient himself got infected, and he actually went around, visited a lot of different uh, public events, including one event with over 1,500 people. And so this generated a lot of public outrage. And so eventually what happened was the municipal city government uh, stepped in and did their own contact tracing procedures to get ahead of the virus and to contain it, which is probably one of the reasons why Korea had a very low death rate from MERS. And so after that experience as well, uh, there was a lot learned about the importance of information and what the public expectation are for that information. And so one of the real powerful things that resulted from that was this uh, anonymized use of information. So for instance, if a newly diagnosed patient appears in my city of Busan here today, within 24 hours, I'll receive a text message about that patient and where they've been in the last week or so. And that information is very helpful because it informs me about whether I may have inadvertently come in contact with that person or visited some of the places that that person visited. And it allows me to make good decisions about whether maybe I should be tested or put into quarantine. Interesting. Again, the cultural differences uh, come to play there. If, if that happened in, uh, in the US, there will be an outcry of my privacy has been uh, broadcast around the world, whereas in Korea and or South Korea and uh, Taiwan of those places, it's entirely different. And this probably is one of the reasons why the West, they're having a, a real problem with it. Yeah, I do think so. But there's also a legality aspect, too, that needs to be considered. So the way that Korea the, uh, empowers their public health officials to have access to various types of surveillance information is they have essentially created a law that allows public health 
officials in a pandemic or epidemic situation to repurpose the access to that information that law enforcement authorities would normally enjoy. So uh, there are very types of information that law enforcement authorities have been using to track down criminals, to catch money launderers, catch tax evaders, and so forth. So some of those pieces of information are credit card transaction logs. So if you're a newly diagnosed patient today, within 10 minutes, public health officials can know, you know where you spent your money in the last week. And this tells you which buses you took, which subway you took, uh, where you had coffee, where you went to dinner. And so that's kind of the beginning of how the contact tracing procedures uh, are, are started. And so that kind of information, even 10 years ago, was already available for law enforcement authorities. But the laws more or less just allow that same those same protocols to be repurposed by public health uh, officials. And that law, fortunately for Koreans, was put in place before the COVID-19 pandemic, whereas in a lot of other countries, even though they might have the laws specific for law enforcement, they don't have the law that allows public health authorities to repurpose those same procedures. And I'm guessing a lot of political authorities in most Western countries probably have already made the decision that the cultural barriers are too great to try to push that kind of law through their Congress or their assembly at this time, which you know I think is unfortunate because I think that dialogue does need to start happening because without that kind of centralized approach to contact tracing, you're really not going to be able to contain the virus very well. Tell me about businesses. Um, uh... Did you have many shutdowns? Um, Korea has never gone through any you know, large scale shutdown. I think the largest scale we, gone, we went through was when the city of Daegu was in the middle of its, uh, the height of its pandemic. And for like a week, most things were shut down. But even there, it wasn't a complete shutdown. For businesses, there were also some uh, targeted shuts, uh, shutdowns. So for instance, uh, night establishments like uh, nightclubs and bars and karaoke bars, some of these were shut down for short periods of time in a targeted manner in certain locations where they were having uh, some of these outbreaks or clusters. Uh, but by and large, most businesses were you know, completely left alone. Department stores stayed open, restaurants stayed open. Now that doesn't mean there wasn't any economic damage though, because you know, especially when the epidemic was uh, at its height, many people stayed at home, so there were revenue losses, uh, but there was really no large-scale shutdown. Surveillance, uh, another uh, hot topic uh, throughout US, Australia, blah, 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 uh, but very necessary. Uh, tell us about your surveillance uh, in your country. Right. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the types of information that's used for contact tracing surveillance purposes are these uh, credit card transaction records. And again, those are available within 10 minutes because all credit card companies in South Korea uh, starting a decade ago, are, were required to automatically store all their transaction logs onto government servers. Now, that doesn't mean the government can just look at them anytime they want. They do have to have a reason to go do it. So that's I, either a law enforcement trigger or a public health trigger. The second type of information that they have access to um, are the uh, mobile phone location logs. So whenever you turn your phone on and it connects to your service provider, your service provider automatically creates a log of all the transmission towers your phone has connected to. And so so, you know, when you're in a certain geological uh, geographical area, there are many towers around you. And to give you the best signal possible, the system will want to connect you with the tower that's closest to you. And this information, it doesn't pinpoint lo your location, but does give you some basic idea of what neighborhood you might have been in. And so this information can be used in conjunction with uh, the credit card transaction logs to give you a basic idea of, you know, did this person actually stay at home when they said they were going to stay at home? Were they actually at this coffee shop that was in this department store? Um, but that's really already a very good starting place to uh, to go deeper, dig deeper, and to find more detailed information. And that detailed information usually comes through the third type of information, which is the CCTV uh, surveillance camera footage. So Korea has a pretty high density of cameras. Uh, most of them are used for uh, catching traffic violators and parking violators, so they're usually on the street. But a lot of establishments also independently have them. So coffee shops, department stores will have them. And so uh, the law is already written in such a way that when you have a new confirmed patient, there is a public health trigger. They can send uh, police officers to the establishments where you had these credit card tr transactions to collect surveillance footage at you know the time when those transactions occurred. And this gives you very detailed information about you know what time did the person actually come into the establishment, what time did they leave, were they with other people, who sat near them when they left, uh, did they get into their own car, did they take a bus, were they wearing a mask most of the time? And so this gives public health health authorities a lot of power in deciding, you know, who in those environments, the other contexts, how much risk they may have been under. Was the tracing and tracking made 
possible by these measures, a major factor in the country's success in suppressing COVID-19. Oh, absolutely. And uh, it really, so there are three steps in the process, right? There's the testing, there's the contact tracing, and then there's the quarantine and additional testing. And all three of these steps, if you have just one of them in isolation, the system doesn't work very well. The power really happens when you have all three coupled together so that the first test informs the contact tracing, and then the contact tracing informs the next round of tests and the next set of quarantines. And you use this process in kind of, you know, a an, an onion shaped pattern of outward testing and contact tracing to try to get ahead of the spread of the virus and to you know contain it. That, that's literally what you're doing. You're trying to contain the virus. In Australia, they had a, a, an app called COVID Safe, which was a, mm -hmm. um, a voluntary, uh, free of course, voluntary, um, but it just didn't work. Do you think uh, government uh, initiatives that this is going to happen and whether you like it or not, because it's going to help the economy still tick over, save people's lives, is better than the voluntary uh, apps and, uh, and, and approach. Uh, so the voluntary apps have a lot of problems. Now, I, I would like to say that having some app is probably better than having no map, no app but the difference is probably marginal and you know it'll depend a lot on how many people are using it and most importantly what's the reliability of the information that's being put into the app because a lot of these third-party apps that I've seen I haven't seen the Australian one but I've seen the one in the UK and a lot of these apps they depend on self reports so even though the locational information may be automatic because you turn on Bluetooth or GPS you know reporting whether or not you've had symptoms or whether you've tested positive or negative that information depends as far as I know solely on the users. And that creates a lot of re reliability issues because someone who has a cough today might think it's allergies when in fact, you know, they're sick. Or someone who's been diagnosed as positive may be reluctant to report that on the app because they're afraid of something else happening that, you know, they want to avoid. And then you always have those small population of people who are just, you know, interested in having fun and mucking up the system by reporting that they've tested positive even though they haven't. So, the centralized government oriented approach is kind of essential for really having reliable information because the most reliable information is the official diagnosis that you receive. And there's nothing that's going to be more reliable than that. So if for the input of the app, you can rely on those official diagnoses, that will really make the app, at least the input part of it, reliable. But then you also have trouble with the output part. So once people have been informed, okay, you were a contact of someone who was diagnosed yesterday, what are they actually going to do with that information? And here, you know, a lot of, especially in the US, we, one of the problems that we've seen, two of, two of the problems that we've seen, one is that the initial messaging about how to handle and deal with the pandemic was very mixed. And so you already have a lot of people who are convinced that you know this is a, a liberal or left-wing conspiracy and that the media is lying to them and so forth. And so even if you give them the right information, they probably won't act upon it in the right way. And then you also have this issue of, uh, you know, some people who, and we've seen this in Korea as well, who depend on hourly income. So even though they know they might need to get quarantined, they might have other economic reasons why they can't. And so creating some kind of a protocol and some kind of a structure for them to safely take some time off while they're getting tested, those kinds of procedures are things too that even in Korea, we're going to have to develop a little more as we move forward. What about masks? I mean, the there was our chief medical health officer said, no, we don't need a mask. And then oh. they're saying, well, perhaps we do. Victoria now has made it, in Australia has made it mandatory that they wear a mask. Uh, yet other states are saying, no, don't need a mask. What, what are your views? Because you're one of the experts in this. Mm -hmm. So Korea, because they have such a strong, well-organized contact tracing system that's been in place for a while, the data is very reliable because it's very unlikely that we've been missing a lot of confirmed cases. And so this really tells you about the dynamics about how the virus normally spreads. And so the example I like to use is the Itaewon Club incident in May, in which one individual uh, visited five clubs over the span of about a 12-hour period, coming into contact with about 1,700 people. Mm. And as a result of that one person, over the course of eight weeks, about 300 people became infected. And these were not direct contacts usually. So these were secondary, tertiary, and so forth contacts, people who were infected by the people who were infected by the people who were infected by the people who were infected by this person. And so, you know, the virus does spread out quite far. Uh, but 
when you just consider that for a second, that a single person can in infect up to 300 people in the span of eight weeks in the country with the most organized contact tracing procedures, that's kind of startling already. And so, you know, even having small holes in your protocols is a bad thing. Now, where the masks come in and where Korean data is also very informative is, of all the cases we've had in Korea so far, about 90% of them have been uh, either family members Rel uh, uh, friends or work colleagues of the first diagnosed patient. So it seems like sharing a confined environment for you know moderate to long periods of time, that is really the main mode of transmission. And then the remaining 10% have been a mixture of other kinds of environments like weddings or funerals and things like this. And so when you're thinking about how the virus spreads, uh, it really is about the infected individual you know, kind of marking their territory with virus, shedding virus in a location, in an environment, and then other people picking that virus up. And so even though the mask might not protect you that much as an uninfected individual, it is absolutely essential to prevent and to prohibit the spread of mm. virus if you are an infected individual. And so the hard part here is, you know, even though people might think they know whether they're infected or not, the truth is they don't. Mm. And so they should be wearing masks, not so much to protect themselves, but really to protect other people. A cure on the horizon or not? Um, we all live in hope. So this is this is your moment to give us some some hope. Okay, so. Uh if you already have the virus, I mean, there are a couple drugs now that seem to be hopeful for reducing the symptoms, for reducing the time that you spend with severe symptoms in the hospital. So far, we haven't seen any magic bullets. So probably cures once you're in the hospital with severe symptoms, the cures, I don't know if you can call them that, but the, uh, the, the treatments that you'll get will probably be combinations of two or three drugs moving forward. That's probably what we're going to see. So it's still better not to get sick. Now, having said that, I do want to mention that there's a lot of evidence now that people who do get sick but recover seem to get uh, organ damage at a fairly alarming rate. So these are things like, you know, kidney damage, intestinal damage. Mm. Uh, Mr. Quest uh, from BBC, actually, he put out a very good article explaining how he seemed to have lost his eye hand coordination. And there are a lot of accounts like this. So it seems like the virus can do some what appears to be permanent damage to a lot of different organ systems. So you really don't want to get the virus if you don't have to. So what's probably going to happen first is we're going to get vaccines uh, and, you know, vaccines are preventative. Um, probably there are going to be a lot of different vaccines that come out and probably the vaccines that each person is going to have access to first is going to be the one that their country makes first mm. uh, because, you know, that's just politically the right way to do it. And there are unfortunately still a lot of questions that need to be worked out once a, virus, a vaccine is ready. So, for instance, who's going to get it first? What's the order? What criteria are you going to use? How much is going to cost? And so there are a lot of questions yet that still haven't been worked out on a you know central government level about what's going to happen once the vaccine is being produced in large enough quantities. But for the moment, uh, the fight is to try to create the vaccine in large enough quantities. So inventing a vaccine isn't that difficult, actually, uh, but having it in large enough quantities to administer to the whole world, that's actually the challenge. People were saying that COVID-19, oh, it's just like the flu, it'll come and go. It's nothing like that, is it? It's nothing like the flu. I mean, the death rate is at least 20 to 30 times higher. Even the way the way that it spreads, it actually seems to spread a little bit better than a lot of cold and flu viruses, too. Um, but the thing that's really scary about this virus is it doesn't affect everybody in the same way. So in, if the death, if you got it and the death rate was 80%, then it wouldn't spread as much because everyone who got it would probably die very quickly. Mm. I, and you know, I don't mean that in any facetious or lighthearted manner. That's just you know the pure hard logical science of how it works. But because this virus not only can give people severe symptoms, but it can also hide very well, especially in younger and healthier individuals, um, it spreads really well, even without symptoms being noticed. So it really is a really bad virus. It's I mean, a, it, it's, it's a yeah. perfect terrorist, isn't it? It really is. And, you know, I'm really disheartened that a lot of countries still are not having that organized dialogue about, you know, on a federal level, what can we do to save lives? Because we're literally having hundreds, sometimes thousands of people die every day. Mm. And, you know... I understand privacy concerns, and believe me, I've written articles about the importance of privacy and you know my ownership of my anonymized data, but the data that's being used in Korea for contact tracing, number one, it's already collected by companies throughout the world. I mean, your, your 
service provider already knows, already has logs of which towers your phone connected to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, transaction logs are also used by most countries to catch, catch uh, tax evasion and, you know, monetary fraud and things like this. So it's really just an issue of repurposing existing laws for this pandemic situation. But mm -hmm. there isn't even any dialogue about it. And that is really, I think, dangerous. I might just uh, nip into the scotch a bit earlier. Justin, <laughs> sorry. Uh, thank you very much. If yeah. I don't ever thank speak you. to you again, you know that I've just gone to the uh, to the other side too. Mm -hmm. uh, look, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we must do this more often. Uh, you speak a lot of sense, and uh, your country is one country that is uh, tackling this head on and making some inroads. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And that's it for BNAP today, July 29, 2020. Be safe. Be kind. I'm Mike Ryan.